Hello, Karen, and uh, I want to start um, with welcome back. Yeah? Thank you. Just checking this is working. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, welcome back. It's really a pleasure to have you here. And uh, for me, as I told you before our meeting, it's a bit of a deja vu feeling. Um, same place, same event, uh, same faces actually. Yeah. And, uh, and it's really nice to have you back here in Vilnius. Thank you. Um, I am so happy to be back here. I can't believe how many people are in this room. It's just amazing. You've completely made it worth my while getting on a plane coming over here. So thank you. Thank you. So Karen, two years, um, short time, long time, I don't know. I think for a writer who writes two books in a year, it's quite a long time. And I know that a lot of new things are happening in your professional life. Um, so what's new? Well, I'm, uh, yes, so I've written four books since I was here last, <laughs> which I sort of measure time in books. Uh, so yeah, I do two books a year. And I... I think when I came here last, I was in the process, or I was about to start writing the first of these books, the last summer, I think it's that one. And um, I'm now just about to start, in the next few months, uh, the final book in the series, book four, uh, which doesn't have a title yet, but um, it's, it's a pretty great feeling to be coming to the end of that series, uh, because when I was here last, I planned to do a series but I had no idea if I could do it. <laughs> um, I've sort of had to learn on the job. Um, so it's been really, it's really nice to sort of have been here at the beginning and now nearly be at the end with it. Karen, I tried to count how many books have you written so far and I lost track a little bit. 20 plus for sure. It is 20 plus. My husband is an accountant, so he does, he counts the books for me. Um, Do I have you here? <laughs> I literally don't know. I think it's about 25 or 26. Okay. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's really a lot. <laughs> and uh, I think 17 uh, of those books are translated into Lithuanian. So Fab. Um, you are brilliant. Yes, it's amazing actually. And I know that your books are translated into to many languages, and your books become bestsellers basically everywhere. Well, I, I, but you know, because amazing people, you know, buy my books and are loyal and you know keep coming back to me. So I'm tremendously grateful, and this is why I love doing events like this because it's so nice for me. You know, 99% of my job is sitting in a room on my own with my dogs. Um, you know, having imaginary conversations with people in my head. And it's just so lovely to come out into the world and to uh, just to get to meet, meet people who are actually reading the finished product and connecting with it. Um, so, yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, so a writer's job, um, seems, same for translator, it can be quite a lonely job, right? You know, you, you're basically uh, sitting alone in front of a computer all day. <laughs> um, however, I know, Karen, that you travel a lot and uh, we all travel a lot nowadays uh, for business, for holidays, um, but I think for you traveling most probably is a bit different because uh, um, your books uh, uh, for me and I know that for many readers stand out as the books uh, where location of the story matters so much that it nearly becomes as a character of the book. So I guess when you travel you explore the places in a bit different way. I want to ask, what comes first, the idea of the story or the location? It really does depend actually on the book. There have been times where I've had the idea first and that's preferable, um, I think, <coughs> because if I know the plot, uh, then that informs the characters and I, and I can sort of choose place according to that. 
but occasionally I'll go somewhere and I'll get a feeling about it. I think what underpins all my books, all my stories, is this feeling of how are we all sort of shaped by where we live, where we're from. Um, for me, I, I remember about 20 years ago reading a magazine, World of Interiors magazine, and there was this woman who was featured, and she was a graphic designer, and she lived in Venice. She had dark, a dark bob, and she was wearing Prada, and she lived in this beautiful canal side palazzo with you know faded murals on the walls, and she was having figs for breakfast. And I just thought this woman was so elegant, and I thought, oh, would I be like you if I had grown up here? I sort of had this feeling of, gosh, you feel so different to me. You feel so exotic and glamorous. And would I have been more like you if I'd grown up in a place that had canals instead of gardens? You know, and and it, and it's all those little details that you know make up who we are. And every single time I go anywhere, I'm always looking around, not at the big monuments, but really at the houses and the people I'm passing. And I'm just thinking, would I be you if I lived here? How would my life be different if I was here? And that's sort of where the stories are. You know, you've got that shared common uh, human experience that we're all living our lives, you know, with nuance and just different difference. And so anytime I go anywhere, I'm always thinking, who would I be if I was here? What would my life be? What would my dreams be? What would my aspirations be? Who would my husband be? And, you know, and it, it's, that's, it's that curiosity that no matter where I go, that's what I'm always thinking. And so that goes into each of the books. So basically, you are drawn to some detail, to some person, yeah. and then you start... Uh, Creating a story around it, yes. building up the characters and yeah. um, the plots. And but it's funny. I don't feel that feeling every time I I go somewhere. So, for example, uh, my husband's family have always holidayed in the summer in Mallorca. So I've been going to Mallorca for the summer for the last 25 years. But I've never once, even though I know it really well, I've never actually had that feeling of, I want to set a story here. Because I, for some reason, I, it doesn't trigger those questions in me. Whereas I did write a book that was set in Spain, but it was set on the mainland in a tiny little village called Ronda. And for some reason, that spoke to me. So it's, it's not a case that I can go anywhere and write a book. It's, there, there has to be something in it that just sets off a little switch in my mind. Um, so yeah, I have yet to write a book in New York. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was telling Karen that last time when you were here two years ago, um, there was expectation that leaked into media, I guess, uh, that you maybe will write a story about Vilnius one day, uh, the story happening in Vilnius or Lithuania, um, and I do not remember you promising that, but I know that um, this expectation has been built. Yeah. And I want to ask, did you have any that sort of the feeling you were talking about while walking the streets of Vilnius? Yes, I did actually. And um, when I was here last, um, on my day off, when, when I had done this, and I had a day in the city with my husband, and um, we went to the Museum of Freedom and Occupations, and that was fascinating. And I probably spent about three or four hours in there. And um, it was so, it really gave me a sense of the history because I didn't really know the history of the country that well before. Um, and there were some really beautiful images in there as well and sort of faces that stuck with me. And sometimes that happens. Sometimes I see a face and that sort of tells a story. Um, so obviously since I've been here, I've been committed to the Wild Isle series. So that has sort of taken up those slots, so I haven't had any choice yet. Um, but I'm a, once I've finished the last one of those, uh, then I'm free again to choose, okay, what am I going to write where? Um, and so it's really good to be back here because I can just explore again, refresh my memory, 
uh, and just let it percolate and see if I can, um, you know, get something going. I, you know, I need to be able to, it needs to be a strong story that is justified. Um, but I hope so. I feel so. If I read correctly between the lines, there is hope, right? <laughs> oh, there's definitely, no, no, there, there definitely is, there definitely That's is. That's nice, yeah. actually. It would be lovely to read a yeah. story plotted in, in I would love to do my that. city. I would love to do that. That would be nice. Karen, um, I think uh, the Wada series is a new chapter for you as a writer, and also, I think, uh, uh, for us as readers, you know, and then it expands your reader circle uh, a lot, because... Uh, all your previous books, if, uh, if I'm correct, are fiction, right? This is uh, the series of books uh, that is based on uh, true facts, uh, very interesting facts. Um, uh, so far, only two books have been published. How many books there will be? Uh, four. Four. Yes. Okay. Um, can you please uh, tell us a bit more, how did you come up with an idea of uh, a story of St. Kilda um, Islands? And um, and why did you decide that it's worth to be not just in a novel but into a series of novels? Yeah. So it, it was a really um, innocuous beginning. Um, I saw in the newspaper an article. It was that big. It was just a little square, and it had a photograph underneath of these extraordinary-looking men. Um, they were wearing, they had, they had very staring eyes, big beards, um, and these woven hats and shirts and jackets, and they were all barefoot, and they were leaning against the wall, staring at the camera, and they, 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 they were just quite extraordinary looking men, very handsome, um, but they had this energy about them, and the headline was 90 years since St Kilda gave up. And what caught my attention was the words gave up. It wasn't 90 years since St Kilda was evacuated. It, was, I, I, it made me think, why did they give up? What, what made them give up? What was so terrible they had to give up? And I read into it, and what I realised was that this tiny, tiny island which is 100 miles off the Scottish mainland, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's two miles long, it's half a mile wide. It's, what's extraordinary about it is it's surrounded on all sides by vertical sea cliffs. So it's in the middle of the ocean, surrounded by sea cliffs, and there's really only one landing point. There's one beach that you can get to if, as long as the wind is in the right direction. And it's almost like a, a crater in that, you, you know, it's walled by these cliffs. And then there's a dip in the middle leading down to this beach. And in the curve of this bowl is this little village, this strip of stone cottages, which is still standing today because it's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But as I started... Uh, researching the island and it was evacuated in 1930 at the islanders request um, it was I realised that they were never able to grow their own crops uh, because the winds uh, were too salty and they were too severe so nothing ever grew they had no trees so they couldn't have firewood uh, they had no fruit um, they, uh, they had no blossom they had no shade no shade of trees so you've got this incredibly exposed, um, extreme landscape, which is literally battling the elements. And what I realised was, this for 2,000 years, this island was inhabited. And at the time of evacuation, there were only 36 islanders left. And effectively, they had dropped below critical mass. So they didn't have enough people who were strong enough to be able to support life on the island because the only way actually they could survive was to scale the cliffs and they are the, the highest vertical cliffs in Britain they're 900 feet and they are vertical and, and in, in order to have breakfast to get an egg they would have to scale these cliffs and they survived on the bird eggs and on the birds themselves and they would go hunting for the 
puffins, the, um, the, all the various birds that are found on the island. And as a result, they became expert climbers, or craggers, as they were called. And they were actually renowned throughout the world at the time for their climbing abilities. Um, and so this was, this was not island life like you might find on the Isle of Skye, where you can land at any point and it's enormous and you can sustain yourself. This, this really is quite otherworldly. And, and it was inhabited for 2,000 years from, the, from the, um, the Vikings through until the summer of 1930, when their numbers dropped so low they just couldn't keep going. And change was coming through, there was a huge amount of social change in the 1930s, a uh, huge amount of industrialization, and increasingly uh, boats were coming to the island as part of modern tourism, fishing boats would pass, and they were beginning to hear about the ease and comfort of life on the mainland. And really the trigger for asking for the evacuation was the death of one of the islands as a young woman who died of pneumonia and would absolutely have been saved had she been on the mainland. And they realized that they, they just couldn't carry on. So they requested to be uh, evacuated. And, and that in itself, just writing about that lifestyle in and of itself would be enough. But um, when I was talking to my editor and my agent about it, in all their wisdom, this was their idea, not mine, in all their wisdom, they said, wouldn't it be great if we set a series of each book set around a woman on the island? And I thought, no, that wouldn't be great at all. That would be really hard work. Um, but actually, it's been fantastic because effectively I've been allowed to tell one story in the round. So we, we have, if you've read The Last Summer, you'll know that there's uh, a death which underpins the central uh, action of all the books. And each book focuses on a young woman and her, her involvement with this event. And so you get different perspectives in each book. But what's lovely is we get to live through St Kilda through each of these women. And they're all very, very different. So Effie, in The Last Summer, is a tomboy, she's free-spirited, she's wild, she's, um, she's a girl ahead of her time, she wants to do whatever the boys can do. Vari, that's Vari up there, she's gorgeous, she's um, the eldest in her family of nine siblings, she's a good girl, she's very obedient, she's very meek. Her story is my favourite so far, I absolutely love it. But what's lovely is getting to experience St Kilda in all these different ways, for all these different characters. Absolutely, I think it's a, it's a beautiful story with loads of uh, real, true historical facts, but you also get to touch the lifestyle of those people through the stories of these young women. Um, talking about Effie in the first book, The Last Summer, for me, when I was reading the book, Effie is actually a character whom you can easily teleport into 2024 and she will fit in very well because she's such a rebel. Yes. She really, to me, she doesn't belong to this community yeah. in a way. She's so different yeah. and she dares to, to step away from social norms, from expectations. Um, so um, was Effie's character something real um, that you came across um, in the documents that you found about St. Kilda's? Uh, inhabitants, or is it like a bit of a of a made up character that also um, pays uh, in a way the price that when we talk, you know, about nowadays women's rights, equality, um, diversity. Yeah. Um, it, it's funny. Um, none of the characters are based on actual islanders, so I did take their names and I jumbled them all together. But although I went to a lot of uh, research. Uh, basically, it was an academic exercise before it was a creative one. So I had to learn about life on St Kilda before I could then set a book uh, upon it. And um, what I knew was that the Earl of Dumfries, who we see in The Last Summer, did actually buy the island from MacLeod, who was the landlord, after the island's evacuation. And he was himself 
an ornithologist, so he was he loved uh, collecting bird eggs. That was very much like a gentleman's pastime in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, Lord Rothschild was the other one who had the great collection. So, so that's rooted in fact. Um, but Effie, I, I, so Effie sort of was born out of, okay, well I need a character, I'm gonna have these men coming onto the island uh, to, to do their bird watching, bird egg collecting. Because of course it's difficult to find ways to get people onto the island, especially when uh, the island itself is cut off to the world from September round until about April, May every year because the seas are too wild. Um, so it's, diff it's very difficult writing a book on a, a tiny island with no resources and then the outside world can't get to it either. So I, I really shot myself in the foot doing this. Um, but this was rooted in, in the truth that the Earl of Dumfries had um, bought the island. And so Effie really then came from, okay, well I need her, I need her to be their guide. I need, and I liked the juxtaposition, the contrast of British aristocracy then meeting this really quite feral, wild island girl who's scampering around on these cliffs with this incredible ability. And what does she care of the airs and graces of the mainland, of the class system uh, in, you know, in, in mainland Scotland? She doesn't at all. And so that made it feel very fresh as a love story that Sholto would encounter someone like her who wouldn't be bowing and scraping um, because that's not remotely her reality. She couldn't begin to conceive of the world that he comes from. And when we do see her go over to the mainland, small things like having a house with stairs in it or a mirror on the wall. I mean, this is the level of adjustment that she's got to make when she comes over to the mainland, much less a Scottish lord with a house full of staff. So it was really interesting. It, she was sort of shaped by that dynamic, and I, I found her as I was, you know, working my way through it. I, I didn't know her before I began writing, but I pretty quickly understood her energy and her spirit. Um, and it was a really good, fun love story to write. Um, and one thing that I found really interesting in the course of writing this series, I was a bit worried about writing a historical series. Will it feel old-fashioned? Will it feel unrelatable? Will these characters feel like we'd, we don't know them? And actually, what's, what's been the biggest surprise to me is that they all just feel completely relatable. Effie could walk in here right now. Absolutely. And that was like, fun. I would, you know, she'd be up here and we'd all be clapping her and she'd just be marvellous. And, and Vari too, you know, she's a rebel in her own way. These are all strong young women making the most of the circumstances in which they find themselves. And that, that has been so lovely for me making these women feel relatable and relevant and, and still modern. I think uh, both women feel very realistic and actually Effie, although she's such a rebel and such a tomboy, but she's also such a, such a kind heart yeah. and such a gentle soul and also at the same time so feminine. Yes, so. absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it, they're very free, spirited. You know, they, they haven't been constrained by expectations of society in the same way. Um, I mean, I should say that St Kilda was a very civilised society. You know, they, they weren't wild. Uh, they were educated, the younger, uh, they were a Gaelic-speaking community. Uh, they spoke Old Scottish, but actually the younger generation spoke English. Thank God for me. That would have been a difficult book to write otherwise. Um, and and they, they would go to church, uh, they were very religious, um, so they weren't wild by any means, but they, they were free from the ideas of being a lady or a gentleman, you know, and that allows them just to be true to their spirits, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I love them. <laughs> Me too. Um, the second book, The Stolen Hours, that 
has been published just recently. Um, the main character is Ivory. She's quite different, uh, although also a young lady trapped uh, in the same island and time in history. Um, this community really lives um, quite different from mainland, mainland Scotland. Um, Vyra, to me, uh, in the beginning she appeared as an ordinary uh, young woman, basically wanting to create a family, wanting to love and to be loved, and basically repeat her mother's life. Yes, yes. She was uh, right beside her mother, helping her with younger siblings. So, but the turn her life takes, it's actually even more drastic than for Effie. Yes, yes. And the choices this poor young girl has to make in her life would, would be, I guess, too much for any woman at any time, would be too much for Effie also. So I wonder, how did this character came up? Oh, do you know, I was worried about writing Vari because when I wrote The Last Summer, Vari is off the page quite a lot, so we don't really see her. Uh, we hear about her, we know she's one of the, the friends, but we don't really see her. And so I didn't actually get to know her in the course of writing that first book. So then when I sat down and wrote the second one, I thought, oh my God, who is she? Like, where am I going to find her? And the, the, the island, if you can imagine it, you, where the village and the beach is, say here, there's a ridge across the middle called the Amblad Ridge. And then you've got another valley on the other side called uh, Glen, Glen Bay, and this is Village Bay. And all the islanders are in Village Bay. But in the last summer, Vari is over in Glen Bay with the sheep in the summer pastures. And this ridge really does act as like a divide. And it's one thing to say is that this island is small and, oh, I mean, um, it's two miles long. The mountains are two and a half thousand feet. That is very, very steep in a very small amount of time. So although there's not much physical distance, you've, I mean, obviously they were incredibly fit and strong and this was all they knew, but you've got a big mountain effectively sitting between these two bays. And so I knew that I had set Vari on the other side of the island um, and I'd sort of created this set of conditions for myself. And I was pretty furious with myself for quite a long time because not only have I got an island that hardly anyone can get to and there's practically nothing on it, but now I've set one of the characters completely on her own on the other side. And, and I thought, why do I do this to myself? But it's when you, you have to challenge yourself to find the story. And it was by putting her in such isolation that actually I found her. And I'll, I'll give you a brief synopsis without giving you any spoilers. Please don't. No spoilers. No, <laughs> no spoilers. spoilers. But, but basically, these young women are of marriageable age. They have, to, they have to marry and have children to repopulate the island. I mean, you know, it's not really a choice. And it's decided that she will go over to the nearest island, which was called the Isle of Harris. And she goes over on the last crossing before the, the seas come up um, in the autumn. And she goes on the last crossing to meet this farmer's son to see whether there could be an engagement with this man, Alexander McLennan. And, and it's about her effectively being married off to a stranger. And even though he's pretty close, uh, the Isle of Harris is maybe... I don't know, a few hours away, and you can just about see it sometimes in fine weather. Um, nonetheless, it, it's about the hard choices she has to make in marrying this stranger. And, um, and the fact is, she, she falls in love with the wrong man. And um, it was really, I think, probably the most difficult book I've ever written because it was really hard for me to find that story as I was going along. Sometimes I do know what's going to happen, as I did really with Effie quite quickly, but with Vari, I was really crawling on my hands and knees trying to find that story, and, and I had to do huge edits and, and rewrites because um, 
it, it was a difficult book to write, but I think it's probably the book I'm most proud of out of all my books. And nevertheless, you are <laughs> proud and you, this is your favorite, trying to it do is. your favorite. It is. I love yeah. her stories. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, it, it, it was a difficult one to find, um, but she was worth it. <laughs> Okay, um, I think um, these series of the books are also quite different in the sense that um, there are more questions than answers at the end of both books. And I think the first book leaves us like, uh, why did it stop? Can I just apologize for that ending for the first book? <laughs> Because it is brutal. It is brutal. And I, I have so many cross people, like, so mad at me. Um, but it was that thing of, there was only so far I could get along in one book. I would have had to write double the amount of words to really finish off those stories. And the point is that we have a love story in each book, but we also have this central mystery. Exactly, and the mysterious murder. Exactly. So, you know, we, it's all set up, and each, each of the first three books sort of sets everything up for the mystery gives you the love story, and then the final book will give you the answers at long, long last. <laughs> so basically, how long we have to wait until oh we God. know? So I'm starting the last book at Easter, and I will finish it in September, and it will come out in England next summer, and so I hope here really quickly, uh, because everyone's waited a long time, and it's agonizing, and it's agonizing for me as well. Um, I just want them all out there, you know. <laughs> and we were talking with Karen before our meeting that um, this is not Netflix, right? You yeah. can't just put on another episode, you know, and keep watching until you found uh, the answers to all the questions. Um, so, in that sense, how is it nowadays to write a series of books? How has the reader changed maybe nowadays? Because we all look, most probably, especially younger generation, for fast content, yeah. um, uh, fast gratification, and um, and waiting half a year uh, for something new can be quite a challenge. Yeah, it's, it, honestly I do think that the way we read is changing, and I think particularly the young generation come through, they want things immediately, they want it to be very snappy, very brief. When I started writing, um, I don't know, what, 15 years ago, um, it was much more that you would build, you would set the scene, uh, you would build tension, you would create something to then pull it down. Now I really do feel quite a lot of pressure to almost start with a bang. Uh, I sort of feel like that's what people want. I tend to naturally write a chapter at 3,000 words, that's just my arc. Everyone's is different. And that equates to about 10 pages. And, and I get a little bit stressed if I run out of a scene at, say, six pages, because then I think, oh, I haven't done my job properly. I've, I've rushed it, or I've, I've, not, I've not given depth here. But then now, I also find myself thinking, well, actually, people want pace. And they don't necessarily always, they don't want the journey in quite the same way. So it is a bit difficult, because I, I'm sort of old school. I did an English degree. I've read a lot of the classics. I, I'm sort of, you know, an old school reader in my mind. And I love beautiful language. And I love to create atmosphere, to set up characters. I want to live with the characters. I don't, don't just want drama, drama, plot. I, I just want character and, and feeling and, and life alongside that. And. That there is increasing tension between those two things. Um, so I've noticed in the book, I do a book for St Kilda in the summer, and then I have to go over to a standalone Christmas book, which is lovely, but the problem is my head is so in St Kilda, the last thing I want to do is put that down, go and find an entirely new set of characters, a new plot, a new world, a new tone, go into that, and then put that down and go back to St Kilda again. It, it's annoying, um, but this, this is the end of it. And I think that one thing, if I do do a series again, I think I'll do them back to back. 
Would you like to do another series? I would, yeah, I would. It's been really satisfying intellectually to carry a book over multiple characters, multiple perspectives. It's very challenging and but for someone like me who writes two books a year, that's a lot of content that I'm getting through. And I never want to be formulaic. I'm always trying to change how I write so that all of my books feel different and people don't feel like, oh, I've read this, you know. You know I, I don't want them to feel predictable. So I'm always trying to switch up how I tell a story. That's actually the hardest thing for me. It's not finding the story. It's deciding how to tell it. Will I do a split narrative, he said, she said? Will I have a backstory? Uh, will I have multiple perspectives? You know, do I have an unreliable narrator? There's so many ways to, to tell a story, you know, and the biggest decision is always, how am I gonna do it? When I started writing the last summer, the first scene I actually wrote is in the middle of the book. And it was only as I got to the end of that section that I realized that was the ending of the book and not the middle. And that I was gonna to have to go back and write all the St. Kilda scenes that you see in the first half of the book. I wrote those second. I, I wrote the book effectively back to front, which was ridiculous and, you know, I'm an idiot. But that was just how it happened. And um, I realized as I was going through that I wasn't going to be able to get the essence of St Kilda across unless we actually lived those scenes with the characters. It wasn't going to be enough to have flashbacks or diary entries or just people talking about it. I literally needed to put the characters there and have the reader live with them so that then everything that they go through on the mainland has some perspective. Because if you haven't seen what they're coming from, how, why would you care about what they're going to? So, uh, the third book, Karen. I know that it's written. It's called uh, The Lost Lover, right? It's being published in uh, England. I yes, think. yes. Um, and uh, and I know that it will reach me very soon, and I will start working on it. I'm really excited to both uh, translate it, but also to to continue reading the story because I really, honestly, uh, love this series a lot. Um, so, could you? Give a little sneak peek into the third book. Yes, What's happening there. So this, that, so the third book is Flora's story, and a lot of people love Flora. She's quite a strong character from the off. So whereas she's a beauty, she is a beauty. And so whereas the last summer, I totally knew Effie and I totally knew Flora because we see Flora, and I didn't know Vari. Vari was off the page. Now. I came in to write book three and I was like, okay, now I know Effie and I know Vari and I already knew Flora and she, I know that there, there's a lot of expectation and sort of want for Flora. She's already got the happy ending in those other two books. Her life is set up. We know the happy ending that she's already moving to and that was the challenge for me was, okay, so what do we care? What's her story? If she, we've, I've already given her a happy ending. So where do I begin? And it was, I had to dig deep to create her love story, which again, the title, The Lost Lover, is largely off the page for a lot of the, uh, the book because of the constrictions of uh, the island being shut off for so long. So it was really challenging. But um, her story ends up in the mainland in Paris. And that was fabulous to go from St Kilda to Paris was such a contrast. Um, and, and her life is just bigger, better, bolder, but also way more tragic. Her lows are really low. And um, I thought you can't go more tragic than Byron's. I'm sorry to say, I'm really sorry to say, just when you think, oh my god. Um, yeah, I mean, my editor has, has trauma issues now because she's like, oh my god. I was like, I know, I don't know why this keeps happening. But it's, um, all their stories are very interconnected and um, it's worth reading 
very closely. You've got to be so on it with the translation. No pressure, but you've got to stay on because those clues are in there. And there, and there are some. You'll read some things and you'll think, well, that doesn't make sense. That's a contradiction or that hasn't... No, it's all deliberate. There are deliberate mistakes and they're telling you something, but you haven't got the full story yet. You haven't got the full perspective. And it's only as we go through all three of them that it all starts to build and to make sense. So Flora, and a lot of people thought Flora's book was going to be the second book because the ending of book one slightly points towards Flora. But the very fact that the second book is not Flora shows you, it sort of shows you that there's much more going on than you think. So, I'm sorry, I'm talking in riddles, but I don't want to give you any spoilers, um, but it's... It is one big riddle. Yeah, it is a big <laughs> riddle. But yeah, Flora's is a very exciting love story. Obviously, it had to have that epic feel, um, because she's that large in the life. She's sort of iconic, so, you know, Vari is so much quieter, and but her, her love story is very beautiful and low-key. Flora's was always going to be the big, massive love at first sight. It had to be that. Um, so there was a bit of pressure to deliver that. And then, of course, to, in some way, uh, dismantle her happy ending. Uh, because, of course, if, we, if I give her the happy ending, why, why read the book? So um, she doesn't have it quite yet. <laughs> and you mentioned, uh, Karen, that... Uh fourth book will be quite different. Yes, that will be different. The fourth book will be uh, centred, it will be primarily centred on a character called Jane Ferguson, who we do see through all the books. And she is, she's a much more peripheral character. She's not core like the three girls. She's married to Norman Ferguson, who's not a particularly nice man. And what we do know about Jane is that she has the gift of second sight. So, um, in Celtic communities, Gaelic communities, there was a very strong belief in second sight, the ability to uh, foresee someone's death. And actually, in, in my family, uh, my, my father's Scottish, um, that there was a relative who believed, apparently she had it, so I mean, you know, it was fairly prevalent. And um, so that book is going to open on Jane having a vision of an islander's death, but we won't know whose. And really that book is going to centre on resolving the mystery that we see in the first three books, but it is also going to carry on with the, each of the characters in books one, two, and three, Effie, Vari, and Flora. We're going to see how their love stories continue on the mainland. Because if you've read The, the Last Summer, you'll know that there is simply no way Effie and Sholto are going to be able to go riding off into the sunset, you know, uh, the, the son of an earl and a, a wild island girl in the British class system in 1930s Britain. You know, that was not going to happen. So um, they're going to have resistance to their love affair. Um, and then Vari's love affair and also Flora's They've all got their issues, which will need resolution in book four. So that book will be told through Jane, but we're going to be very much more picking up with the other three girls and bringing their stories to a conclusion. So Amazing. I hope that will make everyone very happy. <laughs> really looking forward to, to reading and, uh, and translating um, other books. Um, Karen, our time is... I talk so much. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's a pleasure to listen oh. to you. You're a great storyteller. Now, one last question. I think it's always interesting to a little bit uh, get a touch of you as a as a person, your real life, your your daily life. In the acknowledgments of the books, you you open up a little bit, thanking your team, of course, but also your family for yes. being there for you, yes. for feeding you. Oh my God. <laughs> So can you tell a bit, a little bit about your private life, uh, as much as you can do and want to do it? Uh, yes, so I, I live in, in the countryside in, in Sussex, um, in England, so um, I live about 40 miles outside of London. 90% uh, of my time I'm on my own in the house, 
with my two dogs, surrounded by sheep. I mean, that is my life. Um, I've got three children who are 17, 19, and 21. Uh, two boys and a girl. My girl is my youngest. And, um, and my husband is an accountant. He, for the life of him, cannot understand my job and why I cannot pot. He just wants me to have spreadsheets and I can't do it. And I'll walk in at a, I'll walk in, in the evening going, oh my God, it's a nightmare. I've run out of story. I'm gonna to have to abandon the whole thing. And he just looks at me and he says, are you at 30,000 words? And I'm like, how did you know? He's like, you always do this at 30,000 words. And he hands me a glass of wine and he says, it'll be okay. <laughs> and somehow it always is. Um, so he's very calm and he's, you know, not at all creative and he is a bit baffled and bewildered by me. Um, but it's wonderful. And so I've just been on a very big deadline for the Christmas book. And when I tell you, if he didn't bring my meals to me, I'd be a, well, actually, I wish he wouldn't bring my meals to me and I'd be a stone lighter. You know, he, he, he's had to feed me. Um, he, I just go into the zone and I sort of stop my life, which isn't good, but it's what I do. And, uh, and he's a massive support. Um, I don't think my children actually know I'm a writer. They couldn't care less. Um, I think they just think I've Teenagers gone away for the weekend to have just a perfectly nice jolly. Um, they certainly don't read my books. Um, and they're very amused by anything if they... I'm sure they will, won't yeah. they? <laughs> we'll see. But my dogs are my greatest fans. They adore me. <laughs> uh, I must say, I've met your husband today over breakfast and also uh, two years ago. Um, I think you make a beautiful couple. And although your careers are very, very different, yeah. I can see how your husband knows everything about your writing. He knows the plots of the stories, he helps you a little bit with research, I can hear. Yeah. So that's an amazing team. I think you're making a great team. Oh, thank you. He, he's very good. At, um, I will show him an early draft. And he's very good if I need, for example, to know about a car or a certain wine, then he's my man. Like, he'll say, oh, you want this car, they'd be drinking this wine, because <laughs> I don't know about any of those things. So he sort of proofreads for me on those things. Um, and he's very sweet. He sits on the London Underground, proudly reading my books, and uh, sort of advertises them. It's very sweet. <laughs> Thank you, Karen, for sharing a little bit of your private life. No, 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 no. That's very nice. Karen, we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for coming back to Venice. My pleasure. I wish you a um, nice time in Venice. I thank know you. that you're going to have uh, a walk. Yes, loads more exploring, galleries, museums, cafes, works. And I don't say goodbye, I say maybe until next time. Yes, definitely, yeah. definitely. Thank you all so much for coming out. Thank you.